1942. It's springtime in Iran. We're in the heart of the Second World War. A recently released group of Polish soldiers stumbles across a young boy at an empty train station. They stop in their tracks, speechless. They're not so much interested in the child as much as who's alongside him. Grizzly teeth, dagger-like paws, thick brown fur. A stray bear cub sitting inches away from them. Caught off guard, the soldiers contemplate their situation. How did the bear get here? Where does he belong? What should we do with it? Captivated by the cub's human-like personality and surprising warmth, the group decides to take it under their care. They pay the child and go to a nearby Polish refugee camp. But this is just the beginning of a long and strange adventure. The cub stays with the soldiers for months, eating a diet that consists of marmalade, fruit, and syrup. Eventually, they decide to give him a name. A Slavic nickname translating to Happy Warrior. Wojtek begins to assimilate even further with the soldiers, interacting with them and mimicking their every move. He begins to smoke cigarettes, drink coffee, and sleep in the bunks with the other soldiers. He even learns how to salute when greeted. Soon, Wojtek is the unofficial mascot of all units stationed nearby. With his own unit, the 22nd Artillery Supply Company, he moves to Iraq, then through Syria, Palestine, and Egypt. In 1943, Wojtek and the 22nd Company are reassigned to fight alongside the British 8th Army in the Italian Campaign, a high-stakes mission to liberate Italy from Nazi forces. There's only one problem. British transport ship regulations prohibit pets and animals on board. The group must think fast or leave Wojtek behind. Finding a rather clever loophole, the unit officially drafts Wojtek into the Polish army as a private. As an enlisted soldier, Wojtek now has his own playbook, rank, and serial number. But he isn't done yet. Fast forward to 1944. The Battle of Mane Casino. An effort by Allies to advance towards Rome and one of the bloodiest battles of World War II. Shots ring out continuously. Chaos at every turn. The 22nd Company is facing daunting circumstances and a decreasing number of men. Aware of the life or death situation at hand, Varstek springs into action and does the impossible. Picking up cues from his fellow soldiers, Varstek begins to carry 100-pound crates of artillery shells to nearby Polish gunmen, crates which typically require the strength of four people to carry. He does it without ever dropping a single shell. Crate after crate after crate. Now, with the ability to fire rounds at a more rapid rate, Polish troops prevail. For this heroic work, Vorstek is promoted to Corporal. World War II ends shortly after in 1945. Following demobilization in 1947, Wojtek is given to the Edinburgh Zoo. This would be his new home. He spends the remainder of his life here, often visited by journalists, tourists, and his former Polish soldiers, who give him marmalade and the occasional cigarette. A celebrity in his own right, he's even a frequent TV guest on BBC News. Wojtek dies a hero in 1964 at the age of 21. But his legacy continues to live on. You are 
walking disrupt. How does a beautiful national park turn into a bloody battleground all in the matter of a few years? For centuries, many believed that war was a uniquely human activity, something so brutal, so complex, so tribal, that it was beyond the capabilities of any other species. They were wrong. Gombe Stream Research Center, a sprawling park consisting of open woodland, lush forest, and roaring streams. A community of Kasakila chimpanzees live together in harmony, offering each other protection, shelter, food, purpose. Acclaimed primatologist Jane Goodall looks on, studying, recording, researching. For years, the ecosystem is calm, predictable. But you can feel a turn in the air. Something isn't quite right. Something feels off. These groups, once wholly unified, are starting to distance from one another. A group of Kasakila chimps begin to form their own group, their own family and identity consisting of six adult males, three females, and their children. Named the Kahama by Goodall, this newly formed group is roughly half the size of the remaining Kaskila community. At first, this distancing is innocent enough, but it doesn't stay this way. January 7th, 1974. The evening is still. The moon shines through the forest canopy. Kahama chimps are feeding, socializing. Nothing seems out of the ordinary. Then, in the blink of an eye, an ambush. Six Kasakila chimps lead a swift and deadly raid on the new smaller tribe. First blood is drawn. Chimps scream out in terror. A Kahama adult male, Godi, is pinned down and viciously killed as he's caught off guard feeding in a tree. It's a gruesome scene. The first victory for the Kasakila chimps. As an act of celebration, they dance, throw branches, and taunt before going back home. With this incident, the war has officially begun. Now on high alert, the Kahama chimps arrange border patrols, male chimpanzees who quietly patrol the territory, listening and looking for signs of a threat. But the worst is still ahead. Over the next eight months, more raids, more deaths, more violence. As hard as they try, the smaller community simply can't defend themselves. It's a losing cause. The Kasakila chimps go on to kill every male Kahama chimpanzee. In cold blood, they've now all but eliminated the Kahama community from the region. Their conquest is short-lived, however. In control of more land, the chimps encroach on a nearby territory owned by another chimpanzee community, the Kalande. The Kalande are a larger group, stronger, more connected. Outmatched, the Kasakila relinquish the territory and retreat back to their original home. In all, the war lasts four years Eventually, the aggression dies down 
and peace is restored among the neighboring chimp communities. But it isn't without loss. The war comes as a shock to Goodall. For so many years, I had believed that chimpanzees, while showing uncanny similarity to humans in many ways, were, by and large, rather nicer than us, explained Goodall. Suddenly, I found that under certain circumstances, chimpanzees could be just as brutal. Since the deadly Gombe chimpanzee war, researchers continue to document more and more conflicts between chimpanzee groups in Tanzania. The largest member of the deer family, able to grow up to eight feet tall, some weighing over 1,300 pounds, powerful muscles, sturdy hooves, majestic antlers, a substantial presence capable of making anyone think twice about crossing their paths. The moose is a mammal unlike any other. For centuries, moose were used in Scandinavia as transport animals to carry various resources across long distances. They were considered valuable for their ability to thrive in harsh, cold conditions. But the Swedes had a different use in mind. 1660, Sweden. King Charles is on a mission to become a major European power. Looking to make a name for himself, he turns to his closest confidants for strategic military recommendations. Many suggestions are made, but one idea catches fire. Replace horse-led cavalrys with moose. Why? Intimidation. King Charles believes that moose will cause fear in enemy horses. By catching these enemy forces off guard, formations can easily be broken without the use of deadly force, thus saving resources and men. So King Charles officially makes the order, and the moose are quickly compiled. Unfortunately, things do not go as planned. During training, the moose refused to ride into battle, continuously scared off by gunfire. They're indecisive and passive. They can't stay in formation. Susceptible to disease, they slowly begin to die. Soldiers find it difficult to feed the moose, which are used to foraging across large areas instead of being fed in pasture. It becomes clear that the moose are not an effective alternative to horses. As a result, the moose never make it into real battle. Though King Charles' unorthodox move would ultimately end in failure, the story of the moose-led cavalry lives on. Don't be fooled by the paws or the fur. These three stories are violent reminders that there's a darker side to the animal kingdom, a side that isn't likely to go away. Mm -hmm.